Promotional consideration paid for by the following. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get ready to hustle! It's the Muscle Hustle, the mobile game that looks like wrestling, mixed with billiards, and feels like nothing else. Collect, train, and promote a completely original roster of wrestlers, more than 70 in all. Combine forces to create the ultimate tag team as you do battle with giant bosses. Dominate the single-player campaign and win the gold, or become top dog in our real-time ranked PvP League. Want in on all the hard-hitting action? Support wrestling with regret by downloading the Muscle Hustle using the link in the description. Don't forget to enter the promo code REGRET in the settings to instantly get 25 gold. The Muscle Hustle is compatible with all iOS and Android devices and is 94 million bytes. Hey everyone, Brian Zane here. Well, the Royal Rumble has come and gone. Every year, it's always considered one of the most exciting, eagerly anticipated shows of the year if you're a wrestling fan, and this year was no exception. I think they actually came through in a lot of ways, making things very exciting and very intriguing as we get into WrestleMania time. First, let's talk about the setup for Chase Field. It was very minimalist, but it was also very just kind of eye-catching in a way with the entrances coming from the dugouts, and you get the three like thin screens they're walking in front of, kind of like a slimmed down version of WrestleMania 2000 set. Uh, the, the more I watched it, and uh, Jay Biggs actually, who was watching with me tonight, uh, brought that up as well. I think it's funny because uh, you know we're all so used to the same homogenous look for sets on every show, Raw, SmackDown, and pay-per-views, that when they ever, whenever they deviate from the norm in any way, it's kind of like, ooh, well, they put some effort in this year. That was nice. Pre-show begins with a match between Ruble, the Raw Tag Champs, and a non-title match against Scott Dawson and Rezar of AOP, kind of a mishmash mash of two of the biggest heel tag teams in the Raw tag scene right now because Occam is hurt. He's going to be out for a couple months after having knee surgery. So the point of this match was if the makeshift tag team wins, then both teams will get future title opportunities down the line. Not much to say about this matchup here. There's some, you know, the issue of Occam, I'm sorry, Razor and Scott Dawson trying to work together as a team and not really working. Ruble eventually win after the Moonsault Neckbreaker combo. I'm going to give this one, uh, one star to four. Not really much meat on the bones of this match, in my opinion. U.S. title match as Rusev, who's sporting the Wolverine-inspired trunks on this night, goes one-on-one -on -one with Shinsuke Nakamura. It's a rematch from their bout uh, at the end of last year when Rusev won the belt. Uh, the action spills to the outside early on. Shinsuke with a big old kick over the steps onto Ruru. Uh, lots of kicks in this match between both guys, and most of them connect and look good. Shinsuke has Rusev in a triangle choke, but Rusev powers out of it. Shinsuke begins to take the turnbuckle pad off the corner and Lana gets on the apron and does what she does best which is stands and just points and yells at things. Shinsuke gets in Lana's face but he moves when Rusev charges at him so Rusev blasts Lana off the apron and Rusev with a great line going, Lana get up and then so Shinsuke hits him in the back of the head with a knee pins him and Shinsuke regains the championship. He's now a two-time U.S. champion. The United States of Knock America uh, lives on once again. I give it two stars out of four. I think this was a, a good match for the uh, for, for the crowd to get the crowd riled up and everything. I think the finish was an interesting way. Uh, the fact, the fact there's a title change at all in the pre-show, not too many times you hear about the titles changing hands on the kickoff show. So that, in a way, it makes it more exciting. Um, it was a good match. I don't think it was as good as the match for Rusev won it. Um, the finish makes it interesting and continues the feud further down the line. Last match of the pre-shows for the Cruiserweight Championship as Buddy Murphy defends against Akira Tozawa, Hideo Itami, and Kalisto. Early in the match, Itami pieces out of the ring while the other three do moves to each other. Crazy move as Tozawa, I should say, uh, Hideo Itami's on the ropes yelling at K Kalisto and Buddy Murphy on the other side. Tozawa dives through uh, Hideo's legs, through the ropes, and hits Kalisto, who in turn hits Buddy Murphy with a hurricane rod because he's, he's already on his shoulders. Of everyone in this match, Kalisto to me was like, had, had a few more botches than normal, than, than everyone else in the match, but I think it's mostly forgivable. Everyone gets their flip de doos in. The match ends, Buddy Murphy cleans Hideo's clock with a couple of knees, hits him with Murphy's Law to retain the championship. This was easily the best match of the pre-show. I give it three stars out of four. Big excitement. I do kind of think it'd be, I think it would have been a stronger way to uh, be 
begin the pre-show with that just to get the crowd kind of like woke up. I think that was a more exciting match the way to do it than perhaps um, the, the makeshift tag team match from earlier. The show officially begins with the SmackDown Women's title match as Asuka defends against Becky Lynch. Early in the match, Becky beats up Asuka in the ropes and when she turns her back, Asuka gets her in the Asuka lock for a little bit in the ropes as well. Becky working Asuka's arm pretty aggressively here and at times like these two make it look like they're actually having a scrap in the middle of the ring. Uh, on the apron, uh, Asuka tries like a swinging fisherman neckbreaker thing and it kind of looks scary like Becky had to do kind of a weird twist in midair for her to land safely it still looked like uh, it, it could have gone a lot worse than it did it was kind of a fine line there we get a Beck exploder from the top rope uh, which Asuka kicks out of uh, both women steal each other's finishers Becky with the Asuka lock Asuka with the disarm her they both they were able to get out of it Asuka slips into a cattle mutilation and all this grappling they're doing and while she's in the hold Becky taps out pretty quickly which I thought was very surprising and there was not much time between when she got in the hold and when she tapped out not much of a fight there but by that point they were both in so many submissions that I guess at that point they were just tired I think it was a great official opening contest for the show great tension in the ring and again like this this desire between both of them just really go 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 hard on each other really try to lock in their respective submissions which we'll see in another women's match later down the line here I just love the physicality and the finish uh, was surprising you know I wasn't a hundred percent so Sold on Becky winning. I didn't think she was a. I wasn't a hundred percent sure she was going to win, like I predicted uh, last week. But I didn't expect the finish to be like that, where it was just like, wow, she just loses to Asuka clean. There's no shame in that. I don't think at the time, you know, um, when I was watching with some friends, some people thought they were getting she was getting buried. I don't think so. That didn't kill her momentum at all to me because it's not like she lost to just anybody. She lost in a very competitive match to Asuka, who's regarded as one of the top females in the company. So. Not really that bad off. I don't think her stock died down that much. And of course, as we'll see, any alarmist reaction to what we saw in the opening matchup seems kind of extreme in hindsight. The Bar defend the SmackDown tag titles against the team of McMiz. That's Shane McMahon and The Miz. Uh, as they're making their entrance, you see The Miz's dad at ringside cheering him on. And when I first saw that, my thought was, oh, it was a dead giveaway. They're going to lose here because they're going to lose and disappoint The Miz's dad again. He's going to be super pissed at his son. Uh, early in the match, Shane teases the big elbow drop to Cesaro on the announce table, but Sheamus makes the save. Shane dives onto uh, Sheamus instead. Miz takes all the heat. He's the one getting all the sympathy beating in this matchup, which means Shane McMahon is going to be the conquering hero in the hot tag, because of course, uh, when Shane does get the hot tag, he's a house of fire with his little eh, eh, rabbit punches. Eh, eh. We got a coast to coast attempt by Shane onto Cesaro and Sheamus, but uh, Cesaro gets up, catches Shane and does an eternal swing uh, in the middle of the ring there. Shane gets Cesaro in a triangle choke, but Sheamus breaks it up. We get a double white noise, which Shane McMahon kicks out of. We get an accidental bro kick onto Cesaro, skull crushing finale, and then a shooting star press, which looked very good by Shane McMahon. So I will give Shane credit. He made a picture perfect shooting star. And uh, the team of McMiz win. And in their first real match as a team, they unseat the SmackDown Tag Champions, which is not that unlike what happened at last WrestleMania when the same tag team lost the belts to Braun Strowman and a 10-year-old boy. I'm going to give this match one and a half stars. I think Shane did way too much in this match. Almost took me out of it. Uh, not much to the match itself. I think, you know, what Shane did in there was impressive. One, he was, you know, he did crazy stuff. That's what Shane does. He takes crazy risks. And I think that in a weird way, it did, it did kind of like mesh well with like the incredible physicality of Cesaro and Sheamus. Uh, but yeah, I just think the, mm, the match was just, I think of all the matches on the main show, this to me was one of the weakest ones. Raw Women's Championship on the line as Ronda Rousey defends against Sasha Banks in a match that at first I was not too interested in, but as the weeks went on with the way these two were kind of like hitting each other with promos, made me really compelled to see like what's gonna happen here? Who's gonna, who's gonna break first? Starts out fast and furious. Ronda even tries to steal Sasha's three amigos, her tribute to Eddie Guerrero, early in the match. Ronda, they're fighting on the outside, and Ronda like, throws an elbow, and she goes to hit Sasha, but Sasha moves. So Ronda hits the LED ring post shell, and then cue the hackneyed static effect. Oh, she hit the LED so hard, it's starting to, it's distressing the signal. Uh, Sasha, very aggressive, working the arm. Some Sasha Sabre Jr. over here with a joint manipulation as well. Banks with a dive to the outside, but Ronda 
catches her, puts her in the arm bar on the outside. So Sasha's tapping, but of course it doesn't count there. Uh, she, you know, Sasha's working the bank statement again. It even has part of her, one of those strappy straps on her gimmick using to gag Ronda. Rousey fights out of arm submission after arm submission. She gets the Piper's Pit again, and she pins Sasha to retain the championship. I believe this is the first match we've seen her on TV where she wins via pinfall. There's always been submission up to this point. So they're finally shaking things up a little bit, almost one full year into her time as the, in the company. I'm going to give this one three stars out of four. I think it was a really strong match. I think it's one of the better Ronda matches we've seen lately, and I think Sasha really helped bring her A game up. And it was also a pleasant surprise to see a match with Sasha Banks where she took risks but didn't look like she killed herself. So that was a great plus for me to see that match happen in there. At the end, they shake hands after some, some prodding there and some waiting. Sasha holds up the four fingers and she walks away and, you know, what does that mean? Four horsewomen versus four horsewomen? Is it some foreshadowing, mayhaps? Time now for the Women's Rumble match. Kind of interesting that they really backloaded this show with like the whole second half being devoted to the Rumble matches. I was surprised we didn't open the show or at least have the second match on the card be one of the Rumble matches. A very surprising way as long as they did. So number one in the Women's Rumble is Lacey Evans. Uh, so this is her main roster in-ring debut. Huge test for Lacey here after doing a, spending a long time in NXT. So kind of her first real opportunity to show the main roster fans uh, what she's capable of doing. Uh, number two is Natalia. Uh, Lacey does not get a good start in this matchup because she botches a couple things. She botches like a flip, a landing flip and a kip up attempt and so it's not a great look for her uh, early on. I think she makes up for it later on though. Number three is Mandy Rose. Natalia gets both of them in a double sharpshooter. Number four is Liv Morgan of the Riot Squad who's taken out instantly and I think her hips went into her chest on that landing. Number five is Mickey James. She whiffs a few shots at Mandy Rose. Uh, and then at number six, it's Ember Moon. She'll be in there for a long time. Number seven is Billy Kay, but she kind of paces the ring waiting for her friend Peyton Royce to show up. Nikki Cross shows up at number eight. She checks Billy Kay into the wall and dives onto everyone in the ring. And finally at number nine, Peyton Royce comes in to help out Billy. Would have been funny if Billy Kay was just out there for like maybe. 10 spots before Peyton Royce finally showed Just, I'm still waiting. At number 10, it's Tamina, whose biggest contribution and biggest moment in this match is when she hits Nikki Cross with the Superfly Splash. At number 11, it's Xia Lee from NXT. Number 12, Sarah Logan of the Riot Squad. The Iconics eliminate Nikki Cross from the action. At number 13, it's Charlotte Flair. While Charlotte does all her big, you know, opening heat where she just beats the shit out of everybody, there's one moment where Lacey Evans actually eliminates both Iconics in a pretty cool way Way, but it's in the midst of all this heat. So the oomph of the moment of Lacey Evans and what she does is kind of lost in the mix with what Charlotte is doing. Uh, Charlotte eliminates Xia Lee from NXT. Number 14 is Kyrie Sane. And while Kyrie is making her way to the ring, Tamina eases into a warm bath for her elimination. Kyrie and Natalia dump out Sarah Logan. And number 15 is Maria Canellas. At this point, we get a lot of face off between Charlotte and Lacey Evans, which, like, Okay, like of all the possible combinations of, you know, main roster established versus like new call from NXT, that matchup's not something I'm really caring about right now. Uh, number 16 is Naomi, who eliminates Mandy Rose. She is uh, almost eliminated, and she does kind of the Kofi spot. She walks on the barricade to save herself, and as soon as, she, as she's about to get back in the ring, though, Mandy with the receipt and pulls her to the ground, and they brawl their way to the back. Charlotte eliminates Lacey Evans. Number 17, Candice LeRae from NXT. Number 18, Alicia Fox. And number 19 is Casey Catanzaro, whose biggest claim to fame before getting signed to NXT was appearing on American Ninja Warrior and doing very well for herself there. So she's very nimble, very athletic, and oh my God, is she small. Like that was the biggest takeaway I got from seeing her in the ring with all these other women uh, from the main roster, from NXT. Is like she looked like a child compared to so many of these women. So it was very crazy to see her really mix it up with the rest of the talent there. And number 20 is Zelina Vega, who's wearing some entrance attire inspired by Vega from Street Fighter 2. Number 21 is Ruby Riot, and the whole story with the Ruby is she's got Morgan and Logan at her side, and they are pulling ladies out of the ring, beating them up, and throwing them back into the ring so for Ruby can eliminate them with ease so she gets a few eliminations under her 
belt. Number 22 is Dana Brooke. Number 23, Io Shirai, who moonsaults the squad on the outside of the ring after they beat up Kyrie Sane a little bit. Number 24 is the former NXT UK Women's Champion, Rhea Ripley. Dana Brooke tries to eliminate Casey Catanzaro, and uh, Casey does the Kofi spot. I say far more impressive than what Naomi did earlier, but she's taken out by Rhea right afterward. Very good showing by Casey here. Number 25 is Sonya Deville as Rhea Ripley eliminates Dana Brooke. As uh, Zelina Vega pops up from under the ring to laugh at Dana's misfortunes, uh, also out comes Hornswoggle, who looks really weird with like, the long hair and the, the leprechaun hat. So I mean, he gets a pop, he chases Zelina out of the ring and into the ring, and Zelina gets eliminated by Rhea Ripley. Hornswoggle chases her back up the ramp. Number 26 is Alexa Bliss, and the pop that she got for her return was quite impressive. Uh, she eliminates Sonya Deville. Number 27 is Bailey, who eliminates the two top heels in the match at this point, Ruby Riot and Rhea Ripley. Number 28 is Limpin' Lana. She is still feeling the effect of what happened at the end of the Rusev Shinsuke match during the pre-show, where she was knocked off the apron and she hurt her ankle on the landing. So good commitment to the story there. She just limping so much she can't even make her way to the ring. By that point, number 29, Nia Jax comes out. She beats up Lana for good measure, and then she eliminates Io Shirai and Natalia, who's been there since the beginning. So kudos to Natalia for lasting as long as she did in the match. Number 30 is Carmella, and you think it's over, but then out comes Becky Lynch to say she wants to take Lana's spot because she's in no mood. She's no, she's not able to compete. So she pleads to her fellow Irishman, Finley, who finally just concedes and says, yes, you can go in the ring. And that's got a huge pop now. So that was a very interesting way they got Becky back in the match without having to totally like put a wet blanket on Carmella at number 30 because if they had Becky come back, enter herself into the match, before Carmella came out, then number 30 would have been useless because at that point we know who's going to win. Lynch gets into the ring and immediately starts fighting Nia Jax, so they have the history there. Alicia eliminates Ember Moon. Bailey and Carmella take out Alexa Bliss. Charlotte eliminates Carmella, and then Bailey's eliminated. So your final three are Charlotte, Becky, and Nia. Becky yanks Nia off of the apron, so it's down to Becky and Charlotte. But before Becky can do anything, Nia shoves Becky off the the steps and onto the ground so uh, Becky sells her leg a lot she's really hurting here and so we get a very valiant Becky Lynch here as Charlotte is probably showing the most heel tendency she's had in the last uh, month or so, I think, she's really vicious here, trying to get at Becky Lynch, but ultimately, Becky is able to outmaneuver Charlotte on one leg and beat her, and uh, after entering late, she is uh, the winner of the second ever Women's Rumble match. I give this one three and a half stars. I think it's my favorite match out of the whole show. Lots of overlapping storylines, which really made this very exciting overall. Very few, like, little dead spots. In this, sh in, in this particular match, I thought. Just about everyone got a moment to shine, which I also thought was cool. There weren't a ton in the way of like genuine, like, whoa, holy shit surprises, except for maybe for Becky Lynch at the end, which I know a lot of people like speculated would happen, but I, I wasn't gonna believe it until I saw it with my own eyes. What I thought was great about this, how big of an improvement it was over last year's Women's Rumble, was that this match had like zero legends at all. Zero former talent coming back for a nostalgia pop. It was all main roster ladies and like some NXT women to fill in the gaps. And that was it. So I think you saw a lot of really cool like fresh matchups between people who are all trained in a similar background. Because I think one of the big knocks I had on the Women's Rumble last year was that you had all these like women from the past who were brought up in a very like different style and they hadn't wrestled as much. So it's a combination of like the style they worked and how long it had been since they'd been in the ring. And so you've had all this like ring rust, you had all these botches and stuff. This match, you didn't really have any of that. You didn't have any of that awkwardness where you have like a, a clash of styles and generations in the women's wrestling world of the company because they're all kind of under the same umbrella now. So I think it makes for a much more compelling, interesting matchup. Up next, the new Daniel Bryan defends the WWE Championship against the real AJ Styles. And, you know, I feel bad for these guys because they were the match right after what was a very entertaining Rumble match. And the fans, knowing that there's going to be another Rumble match in a little bit, and on paper, a far more interesting championship match in Brock versus Finn, the crowd, their hearts were not into this match. And so... On that level, I feel bad for the wrestlers, but also you know, maybe it was kind of they were conserving themselves because they knew the position they were in. I didn't really, this match did not spark joy with me, to be honest, because I saw nothing different between like this match and like every other match you've seen these guys have in the last couple of months. 
uh, in my opinion. I just think it was just like, eh, like I've seen, okay, they're great, they're great wrestlers. I'm not gonna say this is a bad match. It was just a boring match. I, they were not doing anything I hadn't seen before. And one of my biggest gripes with this whole real AJ Styles thing is that other than hitting Vincent Mann in the face, what has AJ done in the last several weeks to really show how much more aggressive and vicious and real he is compared to what he was doing before? Like, what angles has he done in the past year with like Shinsuke Nakamura and Samoa Joe etc that hasn't involved like an outside of the ring brawl like on the stage or backstage or whatever like what we've seen with this bill with Daniel Bryan didn't seem that different from everything else so I'm just curious of where's the character development where's the evolution in AJ Styles anyway the most interesting part about this matchup is near the end when Eric Rowan shows up in a flannel shirt for some reason he ends up costing AJ the match when the referee is down Rowan gets in there and chokes slams styles that allows Daniel to pick up the win with a uh, pinfall there so you've got kind of Eric Rowan is the Luke Gallows to Daniel Bryan's CM Punk and so this is the beginning of the vegan edge society that's all I can really glean from this whole thing I honestly give this match um, two stars out of four and I'm being extremely generous with that one I'm only giving them like an extra like half star on the basis of like who these guys are and the fact they tried they really did this match just didn't do it for me because not only did it feel like and eh, what's 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 the hook for this matchup you know ooh, real AJ Styles or not but also the fact that also it just, you know it just was so dead because of what happened in the previous matchup they were not going to be able to match up to that excitement level I don't think and so that's why the match really suffered in my opinion in the semi-main event, Brock Lesnar defends the Universal title against Finn Balor. The real David versus Goliath narrative they're trying to push here. So would David actually topple Goliath this time around? Finn starts out fast, but Brock starts, he snuffs him out pretty quickly on with some suplexes and stuff. Finn shoves Brock on the outside right into the corner of the announce table, like right in the tum-tum. Looks really brutal. And so Brock is selling his gut pretty consistently for the rest of the match. And sometimes the point where he's selling like death, like he can't pick Finn up anymore because his gut is hurting so bad. His core is so weakened from that. Uh, so yeah, if he's selling the gut something fierce. He tries to hit Finn with the F5, but Finn counters it with a DDT, and there's a kick out. And from that point on, Finn is just like, he is going uh, going hard the whole way. He's a house of fire. You know, suplex city, try planches a plenty because he's diving on the outside constantly onto Brock. The first one was scary because you could see Brock had to kind of like dive in to like get in a position to catch Finn. So kudos to Brock for that one. Finn hits the coup de gras, but Lesnar kicks out and puts him in the Kimura lock from there because the crazy Lesnar face, the top all crazy Lesnar faces, Finn taps in the middle of the ring. And so a, a, a night of crazy finishes or unexpected finishes because Becky tapping out clean, Finn tapping out clean. What's the deal with, you know, these Irish folks tapping out clean on the show? And then you've got also Ronda uh, winning a match in a way she's not accustomed to by pinning. And you've got, you know, Brock pulling out the, the submission there. I feel that he hasn't used that match, he used that move in a while because because he's been so focused on suplexes and the F5, that's all he's really done. So kind of nice to see that move show up all of a sudden. After the match, Lesnar suplexes Finn a bunch, hits him with the F5, gets all of his heat back, and really kind of like, <laughs> I love Cole's rationale, or is it Corey Graves' rationale? It's like, Brock Lesnar became a believer in Finn Balor, which is why he had to destroy him. Can't show any sign of respect, basically. I'll give this one three stars out of four. I think it was a very exciting matchup. They've gotten very good at telling the story of the guy who almost does it, the guy who almost knocks Lesnar off of his perch. One day soon, hopefully at Mania, they will finally pull the trigger on that and, and tell a story where the underdog actually defeats Lesnar. It's time now to close out the show with the men's Royal Rumble match. Uh, number one is Elias, and as usual, he's cut off by somebody, but this time that somebody is Hall of Famer Jeff Jarrett, who comes out with the old da -da -da, da -da -da theme, and he comes out with like the five, six suspender outfit, and the hat, and everything, he does the strut, Good Lord, what is happening here to Jeff Jarrett? Did he owe somebody money? Are they really still that bitter what happened when he left the company in 99? Uh, it was nuts. Elias beats up Jarrett after they tease the duet, and so Elias eliminates him. I really wanted to see them do a version of With My Baby Tonight. Is that so much to ask? Number three is Shinsuke Nakamura. Number four is Kurt Angle. I'm like, wow, two out of the four entrants so far have been former TNA World Champions. How many more of those we're going to see tonight? You'll find out. Number five is Big E of the 
New Day. Shinsuke eliminates Angle. Number six is Johnny Gargano, the new NXT North American champion. Number seven, Jinder Mahal. Gargano eliminates Jinder. Number eight is Samoa Joe. That makes three former world, TNA world champions. He eliminates Big E. Number nine is Kurt Hawkins, who does some hit and run tactics and hides under the ring. Number 10 is Seth Rollins. He eliminates Elias. And number 11 is Titus O'Neil. They do a nice kind of throwback to the World Slide incident from last year's Greatest Royal Rumble, where he stops himself from uh, tripping this time. Then he sees Kurt Hawkins pop out from under the apron. They lock eyes, and then Titus chases him under the ring. Why he's giving a crap about what Kurt Hawkins is doing under the ring, I have no idea. But anyway, Hawkins chases, he, he, he leads Titus back into the ring, and he actually eliminates Titus by pulling the rope down. So Hawkins actually gets kind of a, a win, so to speak. He eliminates Titus, but then he is taken out by Samoa Joe. And number 12 is Kofi Kingston. Number 13 is Mustafa Ali, who eliminates the new U.S. champion, Shinsuke Nakamura. And I think it takes maybe one guess to figure out where Mustafa is going to be creatively, at least for the next few weeks. Number Number 14 is Dean Ambrose. He eliminates Gargano. And number 15 is Noe Jose, who is instantly eliminated. And as he's dancing back up the ramp, Drew McIntyre shows up at number 16. That's now four former TNA champs in this match. Technically impact for, for Drew, but still. He beats up Jose and a few of the Rosebud conga liners on the way. Number 17 is Xavier Woods. He rescues Kofi from another elimination, uh, but Drew takes them both out right afterward. Number 18, the UK champion Pete Dunne. Number 19, Andrade, Andrade, Andrade. Number 20, Apollo Crews. Number 21, Alistair Black. He eliminates Dean with Black Mass. At number 22, EO, EO. Yo, it's Shelton Benjamin wearing long pants. Uh, Ali eliminates Samoa Joe, so it's nice to kind of come back from what happened last week in their match on SmackDown. Number 23, it's Baron Corbin. He eliminates Apollo Crews. Number 24 is Jeff Hardy, who for some reason is already selling his ribs as he runs to the ring. Corbin eliminates Aleister Black, and then Drew eliminates Pete Dunne. Number 25 is Rey Mysterio. Number 26 is Bobby Lashley, which makes it now five former TNA slash Impact champions. He's eliminated very quickly by Rollins, and so Lashley beats him up and puts him through a table on the outside. Rollins is still in this match, though. Number 27 is Braun Strowman, who's officially replacing John Cena in the match when Cena was taken out with injury. Braun eliminates Corbin and Shelton Benjamin. At number 28 is Dolph Ziggler, who eliminates Drew McIntyre. So very surprised to see Dolph get the one up on Drew there. Number 29 is Randy Orton. At number 30 is R-Truth, which now makes six former TNA slash Impact World Champions. But wait, a wild Nia Jax enters and she beats up Truth and takes his spot. So we get some very rare intergender stuff happening here where she eliminates Mustafa Ali and beats up a lot of the other guys until Ray hits the 619 and then uh, Orton hits her with the RKO and she finally gets dumped out. Uh, what the fresh hell was that? That was really interesting. Uh, you know, it's Nia trying the same trick that Becky Lynch did earlier only for it to backfire on her. Uh, kind of just basically make up the rules as they go along here with like who can get in the Rumble match. Uh, Andrew Edwards, I'm going to give him credit for this on Twitter because he makes a very good point. What we had here was an intergender spot that, you know, it made the woman look like a heel. It made the men not look bad in beating her up because they were like, you know, they were just doing what they had to do. You could see they were like, uh, I feel awkward doing this, but okay. And, you know, it was also entertaining. And, you know, so many people think that none of that stuff can happen in, in wrestling, uh, to have intergender wrestling, to have it like that. Oh, the woman can't be the heel. Oh, the man's always going to be the heel because he's beating up the lady. I don't want to get into the whole thing about it now. But my point is, what we saw here was an example of it working. It especially works in Nia's favor because she is a heel and she is one of the larger women, so she can, like, impose her will on the guys. And so, you know, I think this was very well done way to have her show up and, like, you know, be the now fourth woman to enter a men's Royal Rumble match. So now she's the second woman to be in both men's and women's Rumble matches, second to Beth Phoenix. Orton eliminates Rey Mysterio. Andrade eliminates Orton. Strowman and Rollins are now finally back in the ring after selling a lot. Strowman eliminates Andrade, takes out Ziggler, and it's a down to him and Rollins. And after some more fighting on the apron, Rollins 
Gaunt finally eliminates Strowman to win the Royal Rumble match. So he went quite a long ways from being number 10 to win the whole dang thing. It started wild with Jarrett. It ended wild with Nia Jax. And then I think they did a pretty good job kind of filling the space in between. My final grade for the 2019 Royal Rumble is an A-. I think this is a really strong pay-per-view this year. If you don't count the pre-show stuff, which I don't put in part of my grade, I think most of the matches were really, really fun to watch. Oscar versus Becky was exciting. Ronda versus Sasha, much in the same way. Both Rumble matches I thought really delivered in a big way, and in both in both matches, the right person won. And there was again lots of interesting, really entertaining surprises and stories woven throughout. Uh, Brock versus Finn was very entertaining as well. Even if you know anyone could say, oh, well, Brock's obviously going to win because he's going to hold the belt till Mania. It was still one of those things where man, they really made you believe for a second that Finn was going to win it the way he really had Brock on the ropes like that. The only things I didn't like, like nothing about this show to me was like truly bad. Nothing even go, oh, that sucked. Like if I have to, you know, these are kind of nitpicks, but I'm putting them in the cons anyway. You know, the fact that AJ and Brian, it was a good wrestling match. I'm not taking that away from them. Like I will give them credit because the match itself was fine. It was just it was slower paced than what we were used to at that point in the night. And also, I like the added wrinkle of Eric Rowan. I think at this point, a nice evolution for Daniel's character is for him to have a heavy. So it's cool to see, like, you know, where they're going to go with this. Two dudes wearing flannel and having beards. It's a match made in heaven. They only just need to get Luke Harper in there. <laughs> It'll be a weird, like, reinterpretation of the Wyatt family where somehow now Daniel Bryan is the leader. And the one other thing that didn't really sit well with me uh, on the show was just, like, Shane McMahon having too much shine on the show. Like, he got his, like, his crazy stuff in, but he also seemed like more of the dominant member of the team of him and Miz, which just seems kind of weird. Like, but when it's one of those things I don't like about Babyface Miz, I think he gives too much. He's just too giving. And so that's the only kind of nitpicks I have with the show. Otherwise, it was a very strong show and it really helps kind of like paint a very a, a clearer picture as we go closer to Mania uh, with where people are going to end up. I'm still curious how they're going to show, how they're going to get Charlotte involved in what Becky's doing and what Ronda is doing. Where does Asuka fit into all this? Uh, we're seeing some mid-card storylines form, at least in the Men's Rumble. And, you know, we're just seeing things kind of percolating and building up here. And I think this was a great way to start the year in terms of pay-per-views. Let me know what you thought of the show in the comments section below. And be sure to give it a letter grade in the gimmick in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. And I apologize for the terrible quality of my voice in this review. But, well, it's just been a long day and let's leave it at that. Be sure to thumbs up this video if you like it. Subscribe to Wrestling With Regret. Buy the t-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com. And go to Patreon.com slash Wrestling With Regret for exclusive perks and bonus content. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.